I have a lot to introduce. Uh, I have four amazing folks who are with us today. I'm going to read short versions of their bios, but the full versions of their bios, some pre-reading and a ton of good resources are in the Dropbox. Please check it out if you haven't. Um, so did you all realize that your last names go J-K-L-M? I know. So I'm going to start with Donna Simone Johnson. <laughs> Uh, Donna is an actor, director, and choreographer who celebrates, liberates, and disrupts as a form of activism. In arts leadership, Donna is on the Ovation Rules Committee, co-founder of Hard Corps, uh, and on the board of the Road Theatre Company, Watts Village Theatre Company, LA Poverty Department, and an associate producer and, direct, and alum for Directors Lab West. She's worked as an actor internationally in tours in regional theatre, 99-seat theatre, and on TV. And her MFA is for California Institute of the Arts. Um, I am going to ask Donna, can you share your pronouns and also what comes to mind when I ask you about your favorite theater experience? Um, so my pronouns are fluid, uh, she, he, they. Um, my favorite, so I'm an LA native and uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday was spent theater row, the complex, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I was 17, I saw a production of Yellow Man by Dale Erlander Smith, um, which is a two-person show. It's about colorism in the South. Uh, I sat in the front row because I got tickets rushed last minute, and I got all the actors spit because the space is so intimate, and it was one of the most brilliant and provocative things I have ever experienced. Um, the writing is phenomenal, yes, but the actors there's something about work that is rooted in, um, I will say, of subcategories of racial oppression. And colorism is very specific, and the actors cast felt it very specifically. Um, and to this day, I still have the playbill, y'all. Like, it's one of those things for me that, um, I remember many years later, I still have it. So, yeah. Pick it up if you can. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Peter J. Quo is a bi-coastal LA native and the Associate Conservatory Director in American Conservatory Theater, ACT, where he serves as chair of the staff EDI committee. He's a theater director, producer, writer, and educator focused on raising the visibility of marginalized communities. Achievements include being part of TCG's Rising Leaders of Color cohort, a directing residency at the Drama League, directing assistantships at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Williamstown Theater Festival, South Coast Rep, and Geffen Playhouse. Peter, I'm so excited to have you with us. Will you share your pronouns and whatever comes to mind as far as that like seminal theater experience? Yeah, um, hi, uh, I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm streaming in from downtown Oakland on the land of the Olanes, uh, peoples. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, gosh. I don't know. Uh, there's so many theater moments. And when I think of one similar to what Donna was talking about was when I watched Sweat at OSF for the first time and I was ugly crying so bad at the end. And my friend who, we, because of how we got her tickets, um, she sat in front of me um, in the aisle in front. So we weren't sitting next to each other. And at the end, we're like applauding and I'm in tears. And she turns around and she's like, did you enjoy that? Oh my gosh, are you okay? Was the response because I was, it's such a disaster at the end of that show. Um, you know, and, and to me, it's because that play pits specifically the thing that makes me the most frustrated about what is happening in our world, our society and our industry is that um, people in power pit those who are underrepresented against each other. And when you see that happening and like people tearing each other apart when their focus is on the wrong individual or a system or circumstance, um, I, I just find that heart wrenching um, when people have that much power and control to be able to like, I'm going to distract from me and get you two to attack each other. Um, and so that's when I'm just, I'm gone. I've lost it. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Victoria Lewis, Vicki, founding director uh, of Other Voices at the Mark Tabor Forum and CTG staff member for tw 20 years, right, Vicki? Yep. And a professor of theater arts at University of Redlands. 
Vicki is a pioneer in theater and disability, working since the 80s in a variety of theatrical models, grassroots, community-based, regional not-for-profit, television and film. In 1982, with the support of an artist in residence in the community's grant from the California Arts Council, Victoria founded the Other Voices Project at Los Angeles' Mark Taper Forum, dedicated to providing theater training for people with disabilities and creating texts to challenge the depiction of disability in drama and the mass media. Vicki, thank you so much for being here. Can you share your pronouns and what that like, what theater experience comes to mind? My pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, um, this is the truth, Hamilton. So um, I was um, lucky to, my, a colleague of mine, we were both hitting a very important uh, uh, birthday. Uh, I never have money to travel to go do things like that. Um, it's that poor artist thing. And uh, so we had both been sniffing around and we just got this idea that this was gonna be something. So as soon as tickets opened in August, we got tickets for January for my birthday. Um, the lowest possible price, which is still very privileged, right? You know, um, uh, and um, when I got there, uh, I was in the lobby and I heard somebody shout Vicki Lewis and I looked around and it was a student who had graduated 15 years before uh, and he was now a house manager and I just loved that. And then I, I'm just sorry, but like four minutes into the show, I was like, I want to see this again. There was something about the choreography, the music, it was completely realized, and um, uh, and now I um, this is not a this is not an advertisement for Disney Plus, but I will actually get to see it again. I really love history, and um, I love it also when smart people become the lead character. That somebody who with it like that, um, I love that heartbreaking song. Um, you know, of losing the child. So it was just, and the actors, you know, the original cast wasn't, anyhow. So um, there's a million plays that have shaped me, but I have to admit that's what came to mind. Amazing. Thank you. Yes, very timely today. <laughs> and Alex, oh, my light is still haunted today. Uh, Alexandra Meda, as a stage director, culture producer, disruptor for social justice, and a digital media creator, Meda generates original works through collective ensemble practice that is engaged both in person and virtually with artists and change makers across the globe. As a devised theater maker, she nurtures female driven spaces that center women of color in rich collaborations between the community, performers, scholars, designers, thinkers, and artists. With her work, she aims to positively shift how we interact with, look at, and value the femme body. She's the artistic director of Teatro Luna and Teatro Luna West, a national Latinx slash women of color collective that tours internationally with ensembles founded in 2000 in Chicago and 2014 in Los Angeles. Alex, it's so good to have you here. Can you share your pronouns and your whatever theater experience comes to mind? Yeah, hello everybody. It's so wonderful to be here. Um, uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I really always struggle with this question. Every time I'm asked it, I, I have a different answer every time. But the thing that came to mind this time when, when you first asked it was this piece. And I had to like look up what it was called because I couldn't even remember. It was by Lemmy Bonifacio. And it was, I think, in 2011 during one of the um, Radar LAs. Um, and Lemmy is a uh, artist and director from New Zealand and he has a company, a Samoan company called Mao, I think. And they did a piece that was somewhat inspired by Shakespeare, uh, Tempest and something, something. Um, and there were no words. It was, um, drew from movement and, um, voice work and breath work. And this is the thing with pieces that change me forever, or like I can never forget them or etch them out of my brain is, often my first response is awful. Often I'm like, I hate this. I, I don't like this. There's something happening to me and I'm, I'm resistant to it. And it's only after maybe the end of the piece or even weeks later that I'm like, I can't stop thinking about this. Why did it get inside of me the way that it did? And that was one of the pieces. Um, it was before I, I had seen a lot of international work. So it was, I, was, I was hitting up against that wall. It also had a, a device where it was using light as a disassociative 
um, almost headache inducing thing where it was hitting right like in your eye line intentionally. Um, and I was mad at that <laughs> and I was triggered. Um, but it really had a physical energy that I could, I've never seen replicated. And also, um, some images that I just, to this day, what is that 10 years ago, like are crystal clear in my mind. So anything that, that can seep in there like that, I eventually am going to be obsessed with. Thank you. And you all are making me miss being in a theater space so much more than normal. <laughs> um, so today uh, we had a prep conversation and where we landed after talking about uh, just all of the different many, many ways to approach this conversation is um, we're going to focus this conversation on identifying and discussing tools and strategies for navigating theater spaces and promoting anti-racist uh, spaces of all kinds, particularly. We want to lift up intersectionality and the joy that comes from social justice and civil rights work, creating and promoting equitable and anti-racist, anti-ableist, anti-sexist, anti-discriminatory art making and performance spaces as good for people and good for art. So that is where we're coming at this work. Um, we're also going to do the format a little bit differently. Each of the guests is gonna start by talking for about 10 minutes-ish. Um, and then uh, we're all gonna have a chance to chat a little bit amongst ourselves and then get to some questions as well. So I just invite all of you to listen, take it in, think about it. Um, we have an order. We're gonna do Donna and then Vicki and then Peter and then Alex. So, I am gonna hand it to my friend, Donna. Thank you. Um, I am very grateful that you read our bios because that's my like least favorite thing is to talk about that stuff. Um, uh, so um, yes, I, um, I work in a bevy of arts leadership, essentially, in addition to everything else. Um, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's too much, absolutely. And I don't always show up the way that I want to or I know that I can because it is so much. But I'm a firm believer that, uh, you know, if you're going to talk about it, be about it, right? If you're going to bitch about it, then show up about it. And so that's kind of how it started. And now I can't get off the train. So if you feel like, like you hear something, you're like, I want to do that, please, please send me a message. I'm tired, y'all. I am so tired. I need a nap. Um, but uh, in the, in sort of the, the intersections of all of these different things, um, my focus on these boards and these committees um, with these different groups and advocacy leagues, it, essentially it's been the same, um, which really is to um, examine and hold accountable the constant presence of you know, microaggressions and oppressive culture in this intimate and vulnerable white supremacist ableistic culture that can be toxic and taxing, right? Um, over the years, I have seen in numerous BIPOC and, and underrepresented communities just depart from the theater because there's a constant presence of white ableistic supremacy. Um, so that's why I'm still here because I don't, I, I'm, I, all day I will show up, right? Like I'm, I'm that person and I don't, I really don't mind speaking truth to power as they say, although I have a bit of a tone issue. Um, I'm working on that, but I don't mind showing up in those ways. Um, you know, as, uh, as, a, as a black queer artist, like there are a lot of ways that I am often in the hot seat. Um, and there are a lot of ways that my, like simply my existence can be seen as a threat. Um, sorry, I gotta set this timer though, cause you know, I'll just be talking. Um, can be seen as a threat. Um, and so my predominant labor up until this point has simply become about, become about education and uh, uh, navigating these racist standards. Um, as of late, I am done with that work. I feel like at this point, if you don't get it, they, especially because so many of these theaters are producing works that examine these things, it's a choice not to get it, right? And at some point, the future of the American theater, which is a lot of you, will have the keys in which to continue that fight. But at this point, like my teaching, my emotional labor, done, right? Um, but I'm still here and I'm going to be here. Um, I have found that the American theater um, panders 
to BIPOC. They uh, exploit our historical pain. Um, I don't believe that plays that deal with race are provocative, right? Um, I find them very often be racist storytelling. Um, the programming of BIPOC, BIPOC stories, in particular Black, and I'm going to kind of go between those two because that's the world in which I live in um, uh, primarily, um, the programming of Black plays um, for white audiences is a form of racism. And I believe that a vast majority of the American theater have a lot of racist practices, right? Um, that being said, my disruption these days is a, is a, um, a sense of celebration, right? Because a lot, I mean, things are changing. There's a tide changing. Now, we've been at this for a long time. Ain't nothing new under the sun, right? Right? And that we have, um, we've got a raisin of the sun, then we have Clybourne Park, right? It, same thing, right? 50 years apart. Um, but I think that at this point, especially for Black people, by disengaging from this um, aggressive narrative um, and finding and reveling in the joy, like, like Black joy, BIPAC joy is the experience, right? We come with our cultures, we've been here, we've been through it, we've come resiliently through our celebration. Um, I am here in this space to promote and encourage and support uh, liberation and laughing and dancing and nerdiness and thought and healing on the stage and this idea, this radical idea that we're allowed to live in a vast wide space, right? Um, and that it's okay for us to talk about these things because we have that in common, right? Right, resiliency through ourselves, through our family lineages, et cetera, et cetera, um, while carrying these ancestral and systemic burdens, which are always gonna be here. Um, I am dying to see a next to normal with two black actors just falling in, in and out of love. That's it. One of the most, I, it was torn, I was torn between um, Yellow Man Camille and the East West Players uh, the la, uh, Next to Normal um, because it, it, they didn't do any, and East West Players, for those of you who don't know, is an Asian American theater company, downtown LA. They do exquisite work. Um, it was just, a, it was a story about a family. And that show has a lot of different themes happening with it. And they didn't lean into any of those things. It was just nice to see people existing. It was the first time that I'd seen that show after hearing it. And that, for me, that is that show. I'm good if I never see another production of it, right? So I, I'm looking to, I want to see more of that. And I'm in these spaces, and I'm here with you now, hoping that you join me, join me in this to continue to propel those narratives. Um, you know, Peter talked about the, the supremacist culture that pits groups against, uh, against each other. And I really believe that theater, film, and TV does this the most egregiously, right? And we see that because even when you begin to bring people into the structure, structural or uh, governmental parts of theater, right, people making the decisions, there's a, such a sense of tokenism, right? We get one of each, and now you are here to be a monolith and speak. Problematic. Um, I think most of you, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Camille, um, have seen the document of the statements from theaters recently released, right, about racial equity. It is unconsciousable that uh, some theaters have acted now when, you know, because it's trendy, when there's been a staggering sense of evidence of racism and oppression within their theaters, lived experiences from their Black artists and administrators and collaborators and board members and members in their audiences, right? Um, on top of that, this notion of intersectionality seems foreign to a lot of these places. So I'm fired up and I could get really, really angry. Instead, and I'm looking at this time, cool, 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 cool. Um, instead, I do believe that there are solutions and that we can begin to implement them now, right? That you can help to begin to implement them now so that when you end up in these rooms, you're like, great, I've got plans, I've got threefold, this is possible, right? Um, I believe that building relationship with BIPOC and underrepresented artists um, in a valid, authentic way is helpful, right? Ensuring that office culture and, 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 and rehearsal culture is safe and inclusive, is inclusive and welcoming and affirming, you know, especially for uh, people, who are, who, people who identify as women, right? or trans people, or queer, or two-spirit, or non-conforming, or non-binary, or able, you know, people who are disabled. Like it's, I mean, we all need to feel that that is our space as well. And I don't know that that culture currently exists in that. Um, I think that we can also focus on projects, turning up texts and projects for future development that, rep that really represent the scope of the human experience. Um, we, are, we, will, we, we may talk about the canon a little bit, um, but the canon's real fucked up. 
Like, can we just uh, like completely reverse that, turn it inside out, upend it? Um, and then processes, which is the hardest part, which is institutional learning and change about our protocols. So um, I'm hoping that we unpack some of that, but that's, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Vicki. And Vicki, I know that you've got uh, I, uh, some visuals. And if I know, I, I, I want more Donna too, Peter. Um, we, will, we will come back. Um, if you are watching this later, the recorded version, you may not be able to see uh, what Vicki is sharing. So we're going to add that to the Dropbox later. Um, Vicki, I'm going to make you a co-host and that should enable you to share your screen if you do not already have that. Um, so Vicki, please take it away. So if I talk, start talking, I turn up in the window. Yes. Yes. Uh, I am not turning up. How come I'm not turning up, Camille? You are, you're, you're good to go. If you're on speaker view, then um, then you will turn up, but we can see you. I can't see myself though, how come? And I need to see the PowerPoint when it comes up. Are you on speaker view or gallery view? Uh, maybe that's the problem. Oh, God. <laughs> this is so speaker view. All right, so I just, no, I'm not, on, I was on gallery view. So should I go back to speaker view? I'll try that. Okay. It's you again. It's possible that you turn, did you hide your self view under the three dots? If you, if you pull it down, you may be able to switch over. Hide self view. No, it's not, it's not, um, okay, spotlight video and profile, hide self view. No, I just disappeared when I did that. What happens if you share your screen? Uh, I, I, those buttons aren't, now I, now I, now I, now I've disappeared. Uh, Sam says, try pinning yourself. Okay. But first, I have to find myself. There I am. How's oh. that? I just spotlighted you. Somebody just fixed it. Okay. Fine. I, did. I think. I, I don't know if that's, I don't know if I fixed it or not. But. Right. Well, um, I can now see the share screen thing, which I'm anxious about. So, um, uh, not a tech wins here. First, that very clear. Um, uh, but I'm so excited to be here. Uh, with this enormous audience that I wish I could see, um, uh, and Camille and Donna and Peter and Alex. So thank you so much. Um, when we first got this um, uh, invite, um, I thought I was going to be um, focusing on the activism of theater artists over decades to open the playing field and bring more people in than cisgendered, non-disabled, middle class, white men, right? So um, um, so I was looking, uh, because I, I'm a theater history person, so I like to look that way and see where we've been and so that we're not alone. People have been working in these fields for decades, if not more. So I was looking at turning points like that might interest you uh, during the 1940s and 50s within all the major actor unions, there were uh, subcommittees of, devoted to advocating for equitable access for employment for non-white performers. And some things came from that. And then, you know, everything kind of leveled back down to normal. And we know about that. Or um, the deaf communities protests when uh, Robert Redford got the uh, movie rights for children of a lesser God, and he claimed that he couldn't find any deaf actors good enough to be in the movie. And then Marley Matlin went ahead and won the Oscar for Best Actress, a deaf, she's a deaf actor. Or the 1990 uh, Actors' Equity protest about yellow face and the casting of Miss Saigon, or today's use of whitewashing in the media to call out people like Scarlett Johansson's casting as major. Uh, uh, a character originally created as an Asian in the uh, anime Ghost in a Shell. And Oscar's so white. And then eight minutes of evil, evil that had been going on for a long time, but now filmed, exploded. And our lives changed, our institutions were shaken, um, uh, and um, 
and um, our streets. So then I thought, then what came to mind was, um, again, something that had been visible to me, but now became hyper visible, which is the intertwining of race and disability in police violence. And um, I was interested in, S in articles with headlines uh, with the string of adjectives, disabled, black, disabled, black, American. And um, police killing is the price of being disabled and black in America, black, disabled, and at risk. And then a study by the Ruderan Foundation that asserted in their study from 2013 to 2015 that one third to one half of Americans killed by the police have a disability. So, wow, this moves me as a citizen and as an artist. Um, and I will put some of those links, I'll fill it out, but I'm not an expert. So um, what I ended up wanting to do instead was to introduce you to two um, disabled um, theater artists who have been a big part of my life and shaped my work and the world. So by doing that, I think we can look at some of the systemic um, discrimination and how to work against that that these two people have shown and this is the point where i share my screen so everybody there it is and slideshow uh, uh slideshow uh slideshow Arg. Um, well, everybody can, this is very annoying. Everybody can see that? Yes. Okay. And now slideshow from beginning. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Lynn, this is um, a poet, playwright, actor, and world champion blind judo person. Lynn Manning. Um, this is a painting by a famous disabled uh, portraitist, Riva, Riva Lair, and um, I won't do a full uh, uh, audio description of the image, but um, as you can see, um, the, there's a picture of Lynn. He's um, shirtless from the waist up. He is um, a beautifully muscled and shaped uh, man with a bald head. Um, black man, and um, he has in his hands what the pose is, the pose of King Arthur carrying Excalibur, right? Like he's holding the hilt, and then the sword is pointing upwards. Um, and it, it is not Excalibur, it is his white blind mobility cane. And um, it extends into a separate canvas, which shows the tip of the, of the, um, of, of the, uh, uh, cane, and it looks like a fireworks going through it, right? Um, uh, kind of, it's a bullet. And the bullet is going through the tip of the cane, and it refers to the fact that Lynn was blinded in a, in a um, uh, barroom fight when he was 23. Uh, he uh, went on to become one of the uh, uh, worldwide known playwright and poet, and um, uh, won several awards. His play Waits won three NAACP theater awards, et cetera, et cetera, all right? So there's all of that. And, um, but one other piece he did that's become very famous, um, and it's much shorter, so we can look at it here, which is the magic wand. And I'll just give a little spoiler alert. The magic wand refers to the cane and, um, uh, so we'll just listen to that now and, and anybody let me know if it's not working. Okay, here we go. Quick change artist extraordinaire. I whip out my folded cane and change from black man to blind man with a flick of my wrist. It is a profound metamorphosis from God-gifted wizard of round ball dominating backboards across America to God-gifted idiot savant composer pounding out chart busters on a cockeyed wind. 
from sociopathic gang banger with death for eyes to all seeing soul with saintly spirit. From rape deranged misogynist to poor motherless child. From welfare rich pimp to disability rich gimp. From white man's burden to every man's burden. Is always a profound metamorphosis, whether from cursed by man to cursed by God or from scriptures condemned to God ordained. My final form is never my choosing. I only wield the wand. You are the magician. Okay. Uh, um... I, so that's known for like one of the best examples, most art, greatest pieces of art that brings together um, uh, the intersectionality of race and disability. And um, so Lynn has some, um, illustrates some of the problems around discrimination in education and employment for, um, it's a combination for him of being black and disabled, but um, when he uh, sought training after being blinded with the Department of Rehab. He told them he wanted to get a BA in English literature because uh, he's a poet. And so they went, what are you talking about? We have something so good for you. We're gonna set you up in a newspaper stand and you can have your little newspaper kiosk for the rest of your life. So he didn't bow to that and he went on and he got a degree in English literature and he went on to do have this amazing career. Um, and, you know, one would think, well, if, if it's the whole thing about disabled people overcoming things and becoming perfect, you know, with that tried cliche damaging stereotype, Lynn was a saint, Lynn was a hero, Lynn had, Lynn had done it all. But that's not at all what he, uh, where he took this next step. And he went on with Quentin Drew to found the uh, Watts Village Theater in 1996 and to create theater for the whole Watts community. And um, beyond that, um, and also he taught uh, martial arts to visually impaired children and adults at the Braille Institute. So that to me is a great life in the theater. That is complete. Um, and. Uh, and I also recommend it as a way to maintain your sanity and your health, is to not sit around waiting at the phone, waiting for your sitcom to come through. That bless you if it does, you know, give money to the center theater group. Um, so anyhow, so that's Lynn. And then, and so the second, oops, second, second. Uh, from current slide. All right. So the second person I want to briefly talk about is another amazing playwright who is no longer with us. This is John Beluso, um, a gay disabled playwright who uh, overcame the Department of Rehab in Rhode Island, who he had to tell them he was going to get a degree in journalism because a degree in theater again was not a possible degree for somebody disabled. What? So um, he got that degree at Tisch and he went on to get his MFA at Tisch and he was mentored by Tony Kushner and had a very brilliant, wonderful career until his untimely death in 2006. And um, I want to bring John up because John has this under sense of history and of this uh, image you often hear from people accepting their Academy Awards, I'm standing on the shoulders of, right? And um, this is, I'm going to read this for you. This is what John has to say about the disability civil rights movement in a very personal way. Although too young to have participated in it, I think of myself as a writer who was born of the contemporary disability civil rights movement of the mid to late 1970s. I've always felt that it was the creators of that movement who paved the way for the life I live now. Without the civil rights laws, they struggled so hard to forge into passage. Without the history they changed, I doubt I would have been afforded the opportunity to seek out training and create a life for myself in the theater arts. Um, that moves me, you know, for many, many years after John's death. It's such a, a beautiful and generous um, understanding of our connection to each other in this large family, this legacy we have as theater artists. Um, um, 
I um, there, I have a bunch of things, but I I'll, 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 I'm going to close with three uh, mottos that I if we were all live, I would have all of the 200 people in the audience scream these out loud, but I, I won't go there. But uh, next time, um, but um, I there's. Um, Eddie Gloud, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce his name, Gloud Jr., who's just published this book, Begin Again, Jane Bald's Wins America and Its Urgent Message for Now. He uh, talks about how, the, the uh, with Baldwin's um, input, um, how the white liberals of the 70s couldn't accept the extent of police brutality. To them, racism and bigotry were matters of hearts and minds, not power. And for me, within the disability culture, that rings a bell because everybody feels so sorry for us or everybody feels so wonderful that we took the top off the olive oil. Wow, you're amazing. Um, uh, and I exaggerate, but um, that the next step, which is understanding the large political efforts that have been made to change life for millions of disabled people, who are the poorest, least employed members of our American way of life. Um, uh, that it's not just about, oh, you, I, you know, I feel so good because I'm helping you and I'm glad you feel, uh, people should feel good when they're helping. Compassion is a great thing, but pity is not a good thing. And it's not a conversation between equals. And I guess that's one of my major things is that we come in as equals um, uh, together. So, um, uh, and this will bring me to these three slogans. Okay, the first slogan is piss on pity, all right? Um, and I'm really sorry, I can't hear 300 people say that out loud. I think that would be very exciting. It's a British, you know, it's a giveaway, piss on pity. It's, it's a giveaway. Um, but that the idea that pity is destructive. Pity is, puts us back. Pity is, is about, it's colonial. It's about um, the... The, the Lady Bountiful coming in and helping the, the helpless. So piss on pity. Um, and a n nothing about us without us, um, which is a comes out of South Africa, actually, um, disabled activist in South Africa and became internationally at, um, adopted. And it's a way to look at, and again, this is about a power structure. Um, in my experience, I've been known about a lot of disabled theater projects that were set up, again, to help the handicapped and that were run by sometimes skilled theater artists and sometimes not so skilled. And um, uh, so that is the proof of the pudding and, it's, and it can't just be a token. It can't be somebody at the at, at the NEA saying, but I have to have you because you know, nothing about is without us. <laughs> these things happen. Um, and then the final one, which is a, a, a vote uh, a, a preaching for me about why intersectionality is important and, and why listening to all these voices are important. Um, for years, I have been involved in de demonstrations of which the chant is, hey, hey, ho, ho, nursing homes have got to go. Hey, hey, ho, ho, nursing homes have got to go. Like the canary in the, gold, in, the, in the coal mine, disabled people have been calling out um, the um, tragedy of nursing homes well before the coronavirus. They knew these were places that weren't safe to live. They knew they, these were people, places that took away your, um, uh, your uh, freedom and ability to choose when you go to bed and who you make love with and all of those things. And they smelled. And um, as we know, the, the care was not great. If you were poor and you didn't have family and you hit 16 and you had lived in a quote crippled children's home, the only place for you to go was into a nursing home. So part of the activity of ADAPT, which is the most radical part of the disability rights movement has, they go to the, to the conventions of all the nursing homes of America people, which are raking it in, and they protest that that money should be going to in-home care and, and there's no legislation. So, um, uh, so I, uh, so paying attention to the um, to these these over these overlapping. So um, and I just want to end with something as kind of corny, but you know I like Hamilton. So Frederick D Douglass, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will.
and um, that's the moment we're at and and um, uh, it's okay to demand all right thanks Thank you so much, Vicki. Thank you. And I, um, I see a couple of folks have questions. That's fantastic. We're going to have our two, um, uh, two more presenters, and then we're going to start to open things up to discussions. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peter. Hi. Um, wow. Uh, I learned stuff from both Donna and Vicky today, which is always exciting. Um, I always like to sit in a perpetual place of learning. Um, so that's something that's really important to me, even as an educator, um, as uh, someone who spent a lot of time doing EDI work and certified through eCornell, whatever the hell that means. Anyways, um, because we don't want to keep keeping equity, diversity, and inclusion work, but somehow we do some in certain ways. Um, that's a whole, that's another conversation. So this is a conversation about diversity and representation. And I guess the way I talk about, or when I think about that, I, th I guess to me, it's what are the approaches that we want to do to kind of uh, address those issues? And uh, for me, you know, I tend to mostly focus it on a racial lens, but at the same time, I look at it very intersectionally, as well as a feminist lens. How do we um, promote uh, anti-racism? How do we promote anti-patriarchy? How do we promote specifically anti-blackness? Um, address transphobia, uh, homophobia, um, ableism. Like, all, like there are so many different ways in which this can go, um, and so I think that's strong when it comes to diversity. Uh, and representation. A huge part of it, I think, does come from, well, uh, educating, but in a certain way. Here, it's, I live by a fire station, so you're probably hearing that. Anyways, uh, the thing that I've been kind of leaning on when I talk to more and more folks about this is the multitude of approaches in which we combat systemic oppression. Um, and so I look at it as three different lenses. Uh, I'm gonna go back to grid view, I'm just realizing catch everyone's faces. Um, I, I look at it three different ways and I feel like there's a fourth way that I haven't really figured out yet, but um, to me it's okay. So there's a home and it's not inclusive. It has not made people feel welcome on a regular basis. So what are the different tactics in which we are now creating an inclusive home? For some people, it's completely rebuilding the home, making sure it's accessible, making sure it's welcome. You, they're building their own home, using whatever resources that they can to get to that. The other is okay, burn down the house that exists and take those resources and rebuild a home. I think, you know, that there are two different ways there. One is trying to scavenge for whatever resources available. And the other is taking down the, in, the home that's already sucking up those resources and building something completely new. And the third, which is what I will say is the one I probably adopted the most for myself and I'm not saying the other two are wrong, they're all necessary, is to go into the home that exists and kind of make, take it apart to be able to re put it back together at the same time while it's still existing to make it accessible, make it inclusive, make it feel welcome. That's the path I've chosen. So I predominantly wa wander into predominantly white institutions or uh, ableist institutions or things like that. And I go, okay, this is a problem. Let's fix this, let's fix this and kind of do it one at a time. Um, for me, it's a slower process, um, but it's also one that acknowledges the, the power structures and the resources and how they're just being disseminated. Um, so in a lot of that, I put on a role of educator quite often. And to me, when I think about education, the thing that I think about is um, how we treat ignorance. And I talk about ignorance not as a bad thing. Ignorance is just a knowledge gap. It's not knowing. Um, and I, I want us to be careful of uh, for me, I try very hard not to shame ignorance because the moment someone feels ashamed of their ignorance, they want to hide it. And if they hide it, they're never willing to learn. To be able to point out, oh, this is something I don't know and that's okay. We norm need to normalize acknowledging our ignorances um, because if we're constantly hiding it, we're just not going to be able to have the vulnerability to share. Um, and so that's something that I think is really, really important. Uh, and, and I say that because it's ongoing work. It's gonna take us so long. This one session is one session and when I hope is like 
thousands of sessions that you attend to continue learning because I'm still continuously learning every single day. Um, it, you know, as much EDI work as I've been doing for over a decade now, like me really coming to terms with and dressing specifically my anti-blackness that has been trained and um, placed into me and internalized as well as um, something that has been perpetuated between Asian and Black communities in order to, for us to pit each other against, specifically that thing that I was talking about earlier. Um, that only came about in like the past three or four years in the way that I thought I was uplifting and supporting Black folks and uh, addressing my own anti-Blackness. It was really about speaking for them or speaking over them to be like, I'm going to be the savior and blah, 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 all of that crap. That's a lot of crap in there. Um, let's acknowledge that and let's break that apart. Still take some time. Um, so I say all of that because I, you know, here's what I'm going to actually do. I've been working on this video that I'm planning to record, uh, which is addressing, talking about how white supremacy is very much like the coronavirus. It is a virus that we are all infested with. And so I am going to actually just read this draft of this. You all are going to get a preview of what it is because I think it's kind of just uh, the best way to sort out some of the thoughts that I've been thinking. Um, and I will hand this to you as a gift, I suppose, and then you decide if you want to return it. So <clears throat> uh, it's a, a video open letter. Dear American Theater, and I'm talking to the white and the black indigenous and people of color of our industry. On Wednesday, June 3rd, at the Theater Communication Group Online National Conference convening, there was a gathering that utilized the prompt, and I'm paraphrasing because my brain is processing uh, the pain of our industry still. What can we learn from COVID-19 to re rebuild our theaters with a focus and attention to dismantling white supremacy and anti-Blackness? Yeah, that's a big question. Okay. In the breakout room I was in, it was a microcosm of our industry with six white men, one black woman, and me, a queer Asian American cisgendered male with an invisible disability standing in the land of the Olani people. I will not get into the details of how the power dynamic of that room unfolded. Instead, I will discuss how being in that room with those dynamics allowed me to reach a discovery of how to answer that prompt. But first, we are at a time of great civil unrest. Black lives matter and will continue to matter until police brutality stops and white supremacy extracted, is extracted out of our nation's culture. And sorry, but for me, that means the Black Lives Matter movement will likely continue through my lifetime because white supremacy is so entangled in our laws and our social contracts and our education and our media and our cultural offerings and, 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 and it will take more than one lifetime to unravel. I'm sorry. So how can COVID-19 teach us the about the theater industry, how to rebuild, centering the dismantling of white supremacy and anti-blackness. White supremacy is a virus and anti-blackness is a symptom. Racism, white exceptionalism, unconscious bias, fragility, toxic masculinity, assimilation, and so many more are all symptoms of this disease, white supremacy. And we are all infected. White, black, Asian, cis, trans, hetero, queer, disabled, rich, poor, a virus does not discriminate. I'm sorry if you grew up in a westernized society, if you consume western media, were educated in a westernized school, engaged in westernized social gatherings, walked down a westernized street, or you have been exposed to and been uh, then you have been exposed and you've touched your face, your eyes and your mouth and you are infected. Now, this disease does not affect everyone in the same way. Black and indigenous folks have a compromised immune system because their thymus gland has been working overtime since they were born, fighting the infection internally and externally on a daily basis. The tangible symptoms and effects, pain, shortness of breath, fever, delusion, nausea, vomiting, insomnia, depression, anxiety, a sore throat from screaming and crying, mental and emotional trauma, difficulty walking, difficulty breathing, difficulty existing death. Now, am I talking about COVID-19 or am I talking about white supremacy? Both. White folks and BIPOCs, if you're not displaying those effects, it does not mean you are not infected. It means you are asymptomatic and you might have a dangerous strain because you have allowed that virus to grow and mutate in your body. Without taking the safety precautions of washing your hands regularly with a privilege check, wearing the mask of education, taking anti-racist social distancing precautions, applying the antibacterial gel of transformative justice, you have unknowingly spread a more dangerous strain, causing microaggression, uh, coughing microaggressions, sneezing macroaggressions, shaking gaslighting hands, leaving droplets of triggered traumas, and recycling the air of racism. I have been doing these things. Some of us have been doing these things, and unless you've been doing these things, unless 
you have been doing these things. I can't, oh, the safety of educating yourself. I can't safely be in a room with you. I can't assume you're taking necessary precautions. You need to prove to me that you are. How does that affect theater? Well, our buildings are infected. Our theaters are infected. Our classrooms, our textbooks, our rehearsal halls, our audiences, our artists are infected. So how do we cure the disease so we can gather safely again? Equity, diversity, inclusion. What does that mean? Let's talk about diagnosis. Right now, I'm just playing the role of journalists. I'm looking at the data, consulting with sciences. I'm reporting the virus exists and we are all infected. But what strain do you have? What are your system symptoms? First, don't just turn to someone else who is infected and ask. Don't turn to the sickest and weakest to ask just because their vulnerability to this disease is apparent and effects of it are hitting them the hardest. Perhaps you have a mild strand and you can educate yourself with books written by medical professionals like White Fragility, although that's a whole other conversation we need to have. Or check out the resources of a medical lab such as Art Equity. Consult WebMD of Huffington Post, Teen Vogue, but be cautious, like WebMD, you could accidentally misdiagnose yourself. Approach all these things with the same critical thought you would give diagnosing a personal illness. If you have the time, capacity, and funds, consult an expert that should be compensated. Don't just go to your black friend. See a nurse who has been practicing social justice work. Visit a doctor who is steeped in EDI education and has an established practice. FYI, they are also infected, but they're knowledgeable enough to keep their symptoms at bay and take precautions to avoid spreading the disease. They can help you heal. They can work with you to create a treatment plan to fight this disease. Be aware of over-the-counter drugs that may suppress the symptoms, but don't battle the virus. Be cautious of the nurses in training who think they understand and they believe they have the capacity for the work, but don't. The WebMD experts or the snake oil dealers. All potentially good resources of information, but you still need a medical team of experts from different schools of thought to treat the disease on all sides. And when I talk about white supremacy as a disease, we could also talk about ableism as a disease. We could talk about transphobia as a disease. We can talk about all these systems as diseases. Now, perhaps you have a good friend who is a doctor or a nurse. Take them out for a meal or at home delivery. Get a free consultation. Listen, if you trust the person, don't tell them that they're, if you trust this person, don't tell them they're misdiagnosing you. Don't reach out for help and tell them that they are wrong. So what does treatment and spread of, of spread of prevention look like? First, be cautious of taking the meds prescribed for someone else. They might be helpful, but everyone should be working with their medical team to ensure the right meds and right doses are being prescribed, depending on your case. But like COVID-19, we know there are so many good general treatments, unconscious bias training, anti-racist education, uh, instructional videos. I don't know why I put air quotes on those, disregard those. What does this look like in the theater? Is diversity a cure for our industry? A lack of representation is a symptom, but diversity is a band-aid. Sticking BIPOC bodies into theaters, offices, rehearsal halls, stage classrooms, and artists and audiences that are infected uh, does, uh, just addresses a symptom, but exposes those who are more vulnerable to the disease and showing the most painful symptoms to the, mo uh, to the most painful symptoms to a more dangerous strand. What about inclusion? What does that look like? How are the places and the people that who are most vulnerable will be exposed to being prepped for their arrival? Your boardroom, your faculty, your artists, your audiences who are all asymptomatic to these effects should not be inviting the most vulnerable into your spaces unless you know they have washed their hands regularly, maintain social distancing, ensure all the surfaces have been cleaned to the best of their ability and wear personal protective equipment. That's how you make vulnerable people feel included. You let them know that you are aware that you have the disease and that those who are infected, uh, that you put them around are doing everything they can do to reduce the risk of additional harm upon contact. So what about equity? Equity is an acknowledgement that not everyone, everyone is inclusive. Not everyone believes in science. There are deniers of COVID-19. There are deniers of the death rate. There are people who want to open up too soon when there's not enough education on the dangers of how everyone and everyone, uh, for everyone and not everyone is taking precaution steps to reduce risk to others. This recognition includes that asymptomatic people have more energy, time and access to expose themselves to untreated diseases hidden around, but still reap the benefits. You can go to the beach, you can go to the pool party, you can go to an in-person class. 
that's my fire hydrant or fire station next door. You get to go to the beaches. You get to go to the pools classes. You get to go to in-person classes. You get to get your nails done, your haircut. You get to go to sporting events. Enjoy the pleasures of rest, relaxation, education without getting sicker. Deniers reap benefits and they are asymptomatic. If your immune system is healthy, you're spending your time and try spending your time and energy to do grocery shopping for the immunocompromised. You are edu you are educating, spend time educating other peeps on social distancing, safety precautions. You're utilizing your privilege for the health and immune uh, to help those who are immunocompromised. True equity is recognizing this and correcting this imbalance. Theaters, educate your staff, provide those commissions to BIPOC folks, hire those artists, make performances accessible to those who are weak, do the emotional labor to hold your healthy folks accountable for exposing BIPOC to the, their disease strands. No one a vulnerable person walks into your space, even if you have treated it, they've walked in from a world that has not. So they will need more resources, more support, more mentorship, more guidance. And because you've reaped the benefit of a healthy immune system, you should provide those things. But don't disingenuously ask or offer meaningful support and change and stand behind them, but stand behind them. Some of us have been seeing our doctors and we know that we need additional support. Some of us may be misdiagnosed. So you are, as the groundkeepers of the field, must recognize when someone is sicker than they appear and offer them support at your cost. Justice is the vaccine, eradicating the disease by dismantling the system that make the weak weaker and the strong stronger. Step away from uh, stepping away from prevention and healing but eradicating the disease this vaccine will take a lifetime because everyone needs to dedicate themselves to fight it it's still a little messy it still needs some work but uh i give that to you there you go much love this is where i really wish that we were all in the same space because I hope you can feel the, yeah, <laughs> the applause coming at you. Thank you so much. Please, when you, when you film it, can you send it to us? Cause so many people have said, I have to, I have to, I have to see this. So thank you. <laughs> Wild applause and thanks. Um, Thank you, Peter. I'm really excited to hand things over to Alex. I was saying in the prep call, Alex has um, led EDI sessions for our intern groups several times over the past year or so, um, and is such a beautiful facilitator that I'm really excited to hear her speak as herself instead of being completely in her facilitator <laughs> world. So I'm very excited to hand things over to Alex Maida. Thank you so much, Camille. Peter, thank you. Thank you to all of the panelists. You've just shared incredible work. Um, and I wanna lift up this idea of always coming from a constant place of learning. It, it, the journey does not end. Um, I am very much um, in deeply entrenched in, in these issues and I'm learning every single day. This, um, eruption of uprising has only forced me to contend more deeply and more um, in, a, in a more focused way my own complicity like we all should be right like um, no matter what stage of the process of learning you're in um, and that's if you grew up in the US and if you didn't right so I'm the daughter of immigrants and that work is still being done deeply in in my family and in my home um, so maybe some of you identify with that, some of you don't, but I guess I just wanna say to start that one thing that I'm always thinking about is where am I trying to dismantle intrapersonal bias and racism and prejudice versus where and how much energy am I spending trying to dismantle systemic oppression and recognizing the difference in those two things. I think in the early part of my career, I spent way too much time um, thinking about it on the intrapersonal level and not on the systemic level. And of course, those two things are, are intertwined, but um, who's in, in How to Be Anti-Racist, I think um, even he talks about like, we have it wrong. We think that 
um, uh, people's ideas are influencing legislature and laws, but actually those laws and rules and practices are actually what influence kind of the human, the human notion. And so I bring that to the theater. I, I say that as the framework to think about um, how have we learned what theater is from a really backward set of protocols and um, and priorities. So I work in ensemble practice. I don't at all invest my time in regional theater. I divested very young, very early. And again, there's no one right way. And I, and I really agree with Peter. Um, we need every single form of action, activism, theory, and thought. Um, if you are in a room in a group of people that all agree with you, you your coalition is too small. Right, that is something at, at this phase in my life, I'm really entering the desire to be challenged, the desire to have um, my thoughts expanded as happened here today. Nursing homes, like yes, oh duh, when you look at it from the capitalist lens, of course it's like problematic, right? So, so I just wanna lift up all my panelists and everything that they've said. So I just wanna talk to you, I, I wanna give us time for Q and A, so I'm gonna actually just go pretty quick because I really would love to hear from you all. But I just wanna lift up a little bit about um, ensemble practice and this idea that how do you center people first in the art making? And what happens when you actually take away the privilege that art holds as like this thing that changes lives, which I believe it does, but as stop privileging it as the product as the thing and actually what if we privilege the artist and their process towards making it so that's what my work is about it's about how to expand how we think about how art is made and i actually think about it as a process is how are we taking care of expanding and centering the artist um, a really simple example of that might be when we think about rehearsals, we expect artists to come in warmed up, ready, and perfectly trained. When you start to break apart that model and you start to think, actually, I need to be paying them for showing up so that I can pay them for their warm up, so they're warming up together, so that they're building a bond, so that they are um, getting out of the craziness of their day and, and the pressures of living in white supremacy, and they're coming here and they are making a full transition into creative vulnerability they're making a full transition into like finding that deeper sense of self that is going to make art that transforms an audience right so um the other thing i, I really want to mention is that the form and format of the american theater can also limit to what we think theater is to not just how we think it's made who we think it's for um and and I think of art, you know, this whole this whole conversation since COVID has been about like, well, we've learned theater is not essential. We've learned art, um, art making is not as essential. And I think this is where we've like deeply gone wrong in that coming together for our live performance obviously is a danger to us. So it is not essential in this moment. But how are we not thinking about our tools, our tools of storytelling, our tools of healing? are tools of transitioning trauma that is passed down through 14 generations and turning it into joy. That is a tool that we can share through civic practice with anybody and everybody, but we're not thinking about that. We're thinking about how can I sell these people a ticket? Um, and so often when people are like, we need to get people to support us to protest against theaters and equities, I'm like, who are you going to get to show up at that protest besides the artists? Because we haven't even done the work of showing people what theater is for them. We don't, like, we don't think about the most disenfranchised as theater lovers. I wonder why, right? It's in the way that we make and do these things. So some things that have really just fundamentally changed my life is recognizing that theater exists beyond the U.S. borders. And um, so many ensembles and companies have existed forever through um, protest and all of that, but also through ritual. I really think that we need to understand that everyday people will understand ritual as an entry point to the theater and what it can mean for them in their lives. Um, what else? I, we haven't talked about this failure so i think when i was coming up and going to school failure is the thing you wanted to avoid failure as a bipoc person for sure is the thing you can't you're not afforded it's a luxury you're not afforded um and failure is actually the means to learn it's the means to edit it's the means to um 
take a risk and like fall flat on your face and come back up again. Um, we don't look at theater as a tool to actually train leaders. We don't look at theater as a tool for collaboration across difference, across um, uh, fields of learning and science, right? And they tell us, oh, you're gonna go get a degree in theater. What are you gonna do with that? Let me tell you, I can change the world with that. I can innovate with that. I can heal with that. Those need to be our answers instead of thinking, oh, I can only act, write grants, whatever the, the jobs we have thought about. And the second I really shifted my mindset in that sense, a whole world opened up for me. And in this moment of like amazing change and excitement, Unfortunately, what I'm seeing is we, and I'm going to use the BIPOC folks, I'm, I'm white presenting, I'm owning all of the complicity therein, right? But as BIPOC folks, our lived experiences don't separate us from white supremacy, and we are in fact replicating some really dangerous behavior. There is an urgency because lives are at risk. There's not an urgency because the theater is the way it is. And we cannot usurp this moment and that language to talk about our work in dismantling white supremacy in the American theater. They're two very different things. And while we're thinking about dismantling, all the American theater has taught me is to dismantle. I am interested in learning how to build. So take it or leave it, just some thoughts, but how do you build a life in the theater that is not in opposition, but that is for something? What are you for? What are you about? Who are you for and what are you about? And I think sometimes your path might be the same, but if you're asking yourself those questions, you're gonna be arriving at a place maybe through not a linear line, right? Um, so much more to share and say, but I think I might leave it there so we can get some Q and A. One thing, oh, one last thing I did wanna leave you with. So, a lot of my work is uh, around writing prompts and um, helping everybody realize that they're a writer and they were just told they're not because they don't want, <laughs> writing is how we become better thinkers. And so without this tool, I think we're losing something. So something I often give to people is a prompt that says, you call it blank, I call it blank. So I wonder if, if that's useful to you at any time you're feeling very frustrated that the lines of communication are not open or working, or you're encountering someone who you're feeling is exemplifying like willful ignorance, um, which again, how do we call in in that moment? Try that prompt. You're saying this, I'm saying this, and where are we meeting and where are we finding a whole new set of vocabulary and tools to engage and move forward together? And I think I'll pass it back over to you, Camille. Thank you so much. That's, thank you. Uh, the, the calling in, I've heard you use that language before and I feel like that has, that idea has, has helped me so much. And can you, can you define what you mean by calling in? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let me first say, I'm a call, there, the tool of calling out specifically like led by black women, led by survivors is so important. Like we should not feel ashamed or scared or feel that we need to police how people call out violence, acts of violence in whatever way. With that being said, in everyday microaggressions, moments that are not within that framework of like perpetuating actual major violence and harm, there's a tactic that, uh, that we can use to call in. The way I sometimes use it is I will, sometimes people are like, well, what do I do in that moment, right? You don't know what to do in a moment where something has been said, it's not right, or a structure is being shown that is totally dangerous. And even if you don't know exactly what to say, you can just stop the conversation. You can say, I'm feeling weird. I'm feeling uncomfortable and I can't articulate why, but this, I." Sometimes it's just as simple as stopping. Sometimes it's as simple as saying, hey, you know, there was a time when I did this before I knew X, Y, Z, the implications of that. So there's many tactics um, to the act, but it's about stopping whatever's happening and naming what you, what you are seeing, witnessing, experiencing, or feeling. And it's an important, it's an important tool, um, which gets me thinking. I don't know if you all have heard, oh my God, there's this amazing podcast going on right now. Um, it's the Resma Menekin episode on, 
uh, from the podcast on being, I keep like referencing it. I'm obsessed with it. But uh, this one quote I want to talk about, and this it's related to call in because it's about acknowledging where trauma is shaped and lived for all of us. And so Resma says, trauma decontextualized in a person looks like personality. Trauma decontextualized in a family looks like family traits. Trauma in a people looks like culture. Ah, oh, baby. And so we need to understand that we need to be questioning everything because what you might see is like, oh, my friend who's always X, Y, Z might be how trauma or growing up in the white supremacy delusion has impacted that person. And when you start to think, oh, our American culture is just like this because we're American, like you have to like peel back those layers and really look at why. Why is the uh, institution of American theater the way it is? It was intentional, it's not broken. It was built very specifically. And, and it is all of our traumas that are going into that. So hopefully that answered a little bit of what you said, what you were asking. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to give space before we um, before we open it up to questions. The Q and A is open, um, and the chat is open to pick whichever one you you want to do, folks. Um, but panelists, that was fantastic. I wanted to open it up for a second and see if any of you wanted to like respond to each other or tack on to what each other was saying. Sorry, this is this is my daughter. She loves Zoom. She's a very she's a very loud human. Okay. <laughs> so did anyone want to want to to say anything, any resonances with one another? I saw a lot of clapping and um, and nodding. If things if things come up, feel free to jump back in. But I'm going to take a look at the questions. Um, there. These are wow. These are great, everyone. Um, there's a lot about culture change. I've seen a few that are about changing culture, inviting people into the conversation in various situations, especially within a school environment. Um, does anyone want to speak to some tactics or tools that folks might use in that situation? I have a thought, but I, I yeah, mm, uh, okay, yes. Um, because I work at a school, and also was in grad school in fighting some of this. Um, you know, I, I kind of go back to my metaphor in the sense of like changing a culture, like um, you shouldn't be expected to be a medical professional in this situation of, of extracting white supremacy out from it. Um, if you feel educated and comfortable enough, you know, provide the tools or build support groups or things like that. Um, but it's such a hard situation because schools lie. <laughs> I'm sorry, I work at a school. Schools lie. Um, and, and I'm working really hard with my institution to be able to say, uh, let's be upfront about how our program is still steeped in white supremacy, because all programs are steeped in white supremacy. And if any program is not telling you that, they're lying to you and don't go there. Um, or realize that you have a huge uphill battle uh, to, to go to. Um, so that's the biggest thing is just one of it is acknowledging that wherever you go, the culture is going to be problematic. Um, and that's just the way our society is. And so figuring out how much do you want to invest in changing that culture um, versus how much you want to just invest in yourself. Um, not everyone is well equipped to change cultures at organizations. And that doesn't mean anything bad on you. Um, it's just some people have the skills, some people don't. You need to take care of yourself first and foremost. Um, if part of taking care of yourself is changing culture, that's something like, like, I'm like that. I go into an environment and I see other people suffering and I cannot be help, I cannot live with myself if I don't do something about that, whether it's me suffering or it's other people. Um, and so I feel the need to change culture um, because uh, watching other people suffer is insufferable to me. Mm, I just said the same word over and over again, so. <laughs> no, but 
kind of picking off of that, um, uh, and uh, and the same idea of like how there's uh, many roads and ways and start and ways to do this work. Um, often in, in leadership courses, they'll talk about um, you know we all celebrate that first crazy person who who puts forth a new idea or like calls out something, and we imbue them with all of this power, and they should have it because it's brave and and sometimes that's all you can do at your school is call out the the challenge. Often though, what we overlook is the second person. The second person who is gonna agree and stand up with that first person who is calling something out, they actually have all the power because that's how the rest of the group starts to follow. And so sometimes it's as simple as like, listening and seeing who has been calling something out at your school and stand with them, right? You don't have to rewrite the book. And sometimes you can't because you have to take care of yourself and, and are they actually gonna change? Or is it gonna be an extractive process? Or can you be that group finding other people to help stand? Sometimes if you don't have the skill set to like go in and make a plan for change, speaking up and standing in solidarity is also just huge, huge. I think that um, a, a lot of the ways that we've um, really uh, disenfranchised uh, uh, underrepresented artists starts in the school. Um, I think uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a lot of the, the the top schools. If you look at their faculty, right, and and what and the students that show up there, it feels like a sense of tokenism, right? It feels like a sense of grab bag. Um, I, uh, I, I've been through two master's programs and an undergrad program, and I've seen, I've been in rooms, y'all, right? In terms of like, even the, even the way that we're bringing in actors or stage managers, we're sort of hitting this quota. And I felt when I was in school, like I was sort of meeting that quota, right? I think one of the first things is, is just looking at the canon. And I talked about that earlier, and Cam I'm gonna give Camille a document um, that I would love if, co-panelists could also jump on and add to. I know that, um, Vicki, you actually, um, you've written a couple books that archive different monologues and scenes from, from a variety of different um, disabled artists. And so I'm hoping, yes. Oh yeah, you're, oh one, 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 one. More than I've written. So I'd love to see your book so that I can steal from that book from my list. Um, uh, sorry, what was I saying? Um, but yeah, I think that it's the, it's the same, structural change that we need to see in theaters, it needs to start in the schools, right? Which is encouraging communities. Now I will say to those who identify as BIPOC or come from a queer background or come from, a, from an, uh, a, an otherly abled background, affinity groups, find your people, bring your body into the space and take up the space, take up the room, right? If, if you're assigned something that's traditionalistic or problematic, I don't wanna see David Mamet, right? It's up to you to say, I'm not gonna do that. It's, it's taxing to me today, right? It's traumatizing to me. I'm experiencing PTSD, I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I would love if you could look at these artists instead, right? Um, for those of you who are allies and associates, right? And accomplices, gas them up support those communities too and say, you know what, you're doing a new piece by Alicia Harris. I want to read what to send up when it goes down. I'm going to join you and do a piece, right? Or you can go ahead and use me and I will receive this energy for you, especially in this new world as we're doing this Zoom thing, walking into uh, to, uh, theater that way. Um, it's, it takes action and not just the discussion or the knowledge of. And I think that that's where a lot of um, uh, educational organizations have sort of stopped at their statements, right? And and showing the picture of diversity on the on the brochure form, um, but because you're there, you can call that stuff out tomorrow. Thank you. And this is this is related. Um, I don't. Can you all see the Q and A? I'm never sure about that. Okay. So there are um, four or five questions that all have to do with the role of white identified artists, white allies. And one of them is um, how to use your white privilege to uplift others without being a white savior. When you were a white writer, there are a few questions about if you are a, a white writer or director um, wanting to write and include parts for diverse characters, um, what can you do as a white ally accomplice? Um, does anyone have thoughts on that? Um, oh, yeah, P Peter. Yeah. Um, 
I have this, this, so one of the things that's very key and I feel like in diversity of representation is this feeling and idea that only people who with a lived experience can work on the art of that experience. And I, I think that's false. I think one of the things that we're addressing is the inequitability of representation and access to opportunity. That's really what I think is the, the main crux of why we've devolved into, well, so-and-so can't play that because it needs to be authentically played by this person. Um, because we're performers. Like, uh, I, I would want to hope that not everyone who plays Mackers has killed someone. You know, uh, I, I want to believe that Shakespeare probably didn't kill a bunch of people to write that, but we're in a world of inequitability right now. And so there's a lack of representation, a lack of access to opportunity for people who come from marginalized backgrounds. So that's part of what needs to be going into this equation as we talk about it. So if you are a person who comes from a privileged background, yet yeah, you still can you can work on those things, but make sure you're doing your due diligence, you're doing your research, but you're also working with individuals. I mean, generally also use your energy to uplift others who are actually doing, uh, who have been marginalized, um, like do, do some of that work. Um, but you can't, you shouldn't have to only write your precise um, knowledge. Um, and the way I, you know, the, the thing that I come back to, and this ties me also to the previous question, is this conversation of harm. How do we stop harming folks? How do we start? And part of that is speaking to w avoiding if inauthenticity or understanding that harm needs to be managed in a certain way. I'm actually completely tangenting to the previous thought because this is something that I actually feel is really key is um, you know, and this comes out, I think, in most classrooms, I'm going back to the education thing of the use of the N word when it is used in classrooms or things like that. It's like, well, that's the text that was written or that's, you know, that's what that character would say sort of thing. I want to talk about mental and emotional harm in the same way that we don't talk about physical harm. We have stage combat choreographers um, because we don't want people to actually get hurt. You are not going to assign a scene in which a character like a character uh, sexually assaults another character unless there's actual care being taken there. You're not going to do assign a scene that has physical violence of people going out. You should not be assigning scenes that have mental and emotional trauma attached to them because words like the N-word or any other violence of derogatoriness, that needs to be given the same care and thought as physical violence. And so when we talk about, hey, what are things that you can do be sure to, if you specifically come from a, a background that is um, of a privilege, speak to that. Say, hey, uh, I don't know if we need to be seeing uh, physical abuse of this disabled person right now. I don't know if we need to be seeing um, racial derogatory slurs being thrown at this character right now, unless the room has been prepped that way. And that physical and emotion, that emotional violence is actually going to be taken care of in the same way that physical violence is. Uh, I totally went off to a tangent, but they're kind of related. Sorry. I'm done talking. Thank you. <laughs> Alex, you had, you were going to um, say yeah. something. Thank you. Um, I just kind of wanted to jump on this idea of harm. Um, in transformative and restorative justice, um, and in, in every single amazing book by Black women, um, we have to stop being scared of harm because harm is going to happen. It doesn't matter. You can prep till kingdom come. It is going to happen. It is how do you deal with it and what do you do? And so to kind of translate that to another question I saw in the Q&A about like something happens and where and how do you address it? Every situation is gonna be different. Um, I can't tell you exactly what to do in any situation, but I can tell you that doing away with prioritizing comfort of the person perpetuating that harm has to, like, we cannot center it anymore. That is white supremacy and be like, we gotta be nice. We gotta, like, you can come from love. I think that's important, but that is not over, like, supporting and protecting the person um under that moment right and so call it out there's um there are moments to do it in private but i i believe in transparency and i believe that we can heal through transparent actions and the second we start to do everything in the room there and let's talk about it here and keep about it here like just deal with it in the moment and let everybody speak about it 
and maybe they don't want to. You, and that's the other thing is don't put it on that marginalized person to defend themselves or speak or explain why. Somebody has to intercede, right? So. Thank you so much. And I, we are incredibly at time, um, which is unbelievable. But um, I have a final question. And because we are right at time, I'm going to ask the panelists if you want to answer this one in the chat as well. Um, I, I invite you to do that. This is, uh, as has been mentioned several times, this is not a discussion that ends today. This is a discussion that has to continue for your entire career, for your entire life, and with every single decision that you make every day. Uh, so the question I asked is, what is living in you right now and what will carry you forward from this conversation? Alex kicked us off with piss on pity, which I love. So what is living in you right now and what will carry you forward from this conversation? by everyone if you could stay on a couple more minutes just to drop that in the chat It's a big question. They're starting to come in. Nursing home violence and oppression. Power concedes nothing without a demand. Representing humanity. A degree in theater can, in the right hands, change the world. Yes. Stop pitying, start empowering. Okay, there are so many more excellent questions. Felipe has been aggregating them. So we will capture them and we're hoping to, to pull the questions from all the different sessions and to continue that discussion in some way moving out beyond today. Um, oh, radicality and joy, tenderness and expression. You call it, I call it, you call it blank, I call it blank. From bystander to change maker. Trauma in the people looks like culture. These are so beautiful, everyone. Can you all join me in thanking our incredible panelists? Thank you. We will be putting um, quite a few more resources into the Dropbox after today. Uh, a, a lot of resources, including several that were already mentioned today, some resources from Art Equity. Um, so please take a look at that. I'm, I'll probably put those in by like Monday. So when I send out the invite for next week, I will remind you that those are there. Um, Donna, Peter, Vicki, Alex, thank you for spending this time today and for sharing your thoughts. So much love to all of you. Oh, friends. Oh. All right. And with that, thank you, everyone. And we will we'll see for the students, we will see you next week. Panelists, I will see you soon, hopefully back in a theater soon. All right, love to everyone. Bye.